Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you. So, um, at some point during the talk today, I was hoping to get 10 people to come up on stage with me. Um, that could be quite interesting, given the size of this stage, but we'll see how we get on. I'll do the floor, that's it. Um, so I've got three kids, and my eldest kid, Oliver, he is absolutely surprised and bewildered at why I would stand up on stage and talk to people. And I often think the same thing, but one thing he makes me do at every single talk is take a picture of the audience. So, if you don't mind, everybody squeezing together. I'll try not to fall off the stage. And when I count to three, I'll go one, two, three. Maybe we can say something like, works on my machine, or something like that. Okay? Okay? Everyone ready? You can pull funny faces. You can do anything you want. You ready? Here we go. It's a pretty wide-angle camera, but I'm, so, I'm going to struggle there. But let's have a look down there. That's it. Okay. One, two, three. Works on my machine. Thank you, that's beautiful. He's going to like that, he's going to like that. So last year I was here at uh, Nordic Testing Days and I absolutely fell in love with this conference. It's one of the best conferences I think we've got on the circuit at the moment. Um, but I'll never forget last year, um, I was sat in the old square in a bar at the bottom of town waiting for my friends and colleagues to turn up. I was having a few saku beer on my own. Um, I was watching the world go by. There were kids playing football in the square. There were couples going on romantic walks. There were families out grabbing something to eat, and there was me, alone, with my beer, surrounded by about 35 leather-clad, hairy, scary bikers. In my absence, I was watching the world go by, and I'd failed to realize I'd become the center of a very dangerous-looking group of people. Um, I was terrified, but I had had a few beers. And with a few beers comes something that we say in the UK, a bit of Dutch courage. I felt this urge to say hello to these people. So I leaned over and I tapped one of them on the shoulder and he stood up. And now I'm pretty big, I'm like 6'3", 200 odd pounds, uh, a bit more after this week. Um, but this guy was freaking massive. He was at least 12 foot tall. He weighed about 500 pounds. And he looked straight through me and he said, what? So I composed myself, and in my deepest, manliest voice, I said, I'd like to buy you guys a drink, please. <laughs> it went down well. I was accepted to the group. I was relevant. I had the right skills at the right time, those skills being the ability to drink and some money to pay with that drink for. It turns out that this man was called Tigo, and he was from Finland, and he was actually a thoroughly nice guy. I got to meet all of his friends. They'd come from all over the world to Estonia for an annual biker conference. The next few hours were amazing. I heard stories of love and loss and antisocial behavior and epic road trips. It was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant night. But then, in the corner of the square, came a sight that made my stomach sick. It was a rival biker gang. <laughs> Tigo and all of his friends stood up. It was silence. But you knew what was coming next. We had to do the work. We had to protect our right to be in this bar, in this city, on this night. We had to confront and possibly fight the enemy. I'll be honest, at this point, I didn't want to be part of this group anymore. <laughs> so I did the only thing I could do. I turned to Tigo, and in my deepest, manliest voice, I said, I'm going to the toilet. <laughs> I'll be back. And I did what the only thing a middle-aged English <laughs> IT manager could do. I went into the bar. I walked past the bar. <laughs> I walked out of the back of the bar, and I ran away, <laughs> crying. <laughs> I was in the right place at the right time. I was relevant. But when it came to the reality of doing the work, I just couldn't do it. And the reason I tell this story, and I may have made certain parts of that up, um, is because I see the same thing happening in our industry now. 
as a hiring manager, I get to meet a huge number of incredibly talented, incredibly skilled testers who cannot do the work. Now, this is the same for developers. It's the same for Scrum Masters. It's pretty much the same for anyone that works in our industry. And the reason I wasn't particularly relevant when it came to doing the work for Tigo and his friends was because we all know that when we are at work, when we are relevant, it is about the person. It is not about the skills. Me and Tigo didn't share the same attitude to what we were there for. We didn't share the same beliefs. We didn't share the same persistence in the face of an obstacle. I ran away. I don't know what happened to Tigo and his friends. I didn't share that relentless pursuit of personal improvement for that particular group. And I also was not necessarily aligned to the purpose of what they were up to. I was here for a conference. They were here for a biker meetup. But this is what we do when we recruit, or we should do, is we should recruit for the person, not for the skills. Let me explain. I'm going to introduce you to a tester. I'm not going to introduce you. I'm going to tell you a story about a tester who I knew very well. And his name was not Derek. I've called him Derek for the sake of not announcing who it was. But he was awesome at testing. He was truly, truly excellent at testing. He had an ISTQB, a CP, CBPBOS, an APB, an MIT, an ATM, and a DDT, DTT. Basically, his CV was awesome. He got every single job he went for. He was uber hireable. But the problem was, when clicker will work, is he got overlooked for responsibility in those companies. He quit his jobs often because he wasn't feeling fulfilled. He wasn't being given the opportunities he wanted. He thought that it was because he was working for the man. So he went contracting. And he got contracts because he's uber hireable. But then his contracts never got renewed. This was a man who was incredibly skilled and incredibly talented, but he could not do the work. He couldn't hold down a job. People didn't want to keep him. And it was because of his attitude. He had the skills but he didn't have the attitude. And it's something that we see over and over and over again in our industry. At a conference a couple of weeks back, I met a superb developer. He was one of the world's best renowned developers. He writes about it, talks about it, but he doesn't stay at companies very long. He kept saying to me, the company I'm working for at the moment are killing my creativity. They're making me build things that I don't want to build. Why should I build what they say I want to build the things that I want to build. Really? You're working for someone else. I had a developer once say to me, give me six months and six people, and we'll go off grid, and we'll come back, and we'll have built something that will make you go, wow. Really? How many companies can afford to do that? I had a very well-known tester say to me, I'm going to fight Agile to the death. To the death. Wow. And you wonder why Agile is so difficult to adopt. And the reason was, was she was saying, testing is mine. I'm not going to share it. But in Agile, testing is everybody's responsibility. It's an attitude thing. I had a tester once say to me that the company they worked at sucked. They hated it. At the same conference, I met another tester from the same company who freaking loved it. She was doing excellent. He was suffering. What was the difference? Same company, two different people. It's about the attitude. Has anyone ever heard this? That's not in my job description. I'm not going to do that work because it's not in my job description. Really? We're still hiding behind our job descriptions? Quitting is trendy. This is a shot from LinkedIn. And as you can see, everybody's quitting. It's something we see a lot. Derek quit. He quit. Kept quitting. He's still quitting now. I know him. And he's still quitting. He still hasn't found what he's looking for. It's an attitude thing. Now, the problem is, is that the grass is very, very, very seldom greener on the other side. 
particularly when it's the person that is potentially the problem. We're hearing lots of people talking about bad work and refusing to do it. Has anyone heard that? A few nods. But bad work exists everywhere, and a lot depends on what you classify as bad work. Is it morally wrong? Is it ethically wrong? That is bad work. But is it work that just doesn't inspire you some days? Is it work that you a bit tedious, can't be bothered? Well, that work exists everywhere, and not everyone has an opportunity to remove themselves from places with bad work. And bad work, in my experience, is where the real change happens. It's the opportunity to turn that bad work into good work. So if it's not skills, then what is it? At Eurostar last year, I got speaking to a significant number of people who are struggling to build teams that can do the work of the modern workplace. And I wanted to understand why. I wanted to understand what it was that was so difficult. You can go to any market in any country and say, give me a tester, and you can find a tester. There's hundreds and thousands of us. But is that tester able to do the work that you need them to do? And that is where we're struggling. So a big thank you to Amy Phillips, to Stephen Janaway, who sat here and did a session yesterday about becoming a test manager and then getting, uh, was it sacked or fired? No. You didn't get fired, get fired, but the role disappeared. <laughs> and Adam Knight. So I would encourage you to check out these three people. And the reason I've highlighted these three people is because I sent them a series of questions to really dig a little bit deeper. So I have my own experiences. I have my own observations, but I also wanted to understand what a few people in the industry were also struggling with. I should also point out that as a manager, I tend to focus on behaviors and outcomes. I don't focus on skills matrix. Has anyone ever had to fill in a competency matrix? Yes, was that good? Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I overheard uh, someone the other day um, trying to fill in a competency matrix. And they were arguing, almost a full-blown argument, over whether this tester was a three or a four at raising defects. Really? So we focus on behaviors. We focus on what do people actually do. How do they act? How do they approach their work? And we focus on outcomes. We have to focus on outcomes. Outcomes are why we exist. We are here to provide something for somebody. And from this research, and from these discussions and these observations, I was able to come up with 10 behaviors that I think will help any tester to be relevant, to be employable, and to be ultimately an incredibly good employee. So, behavior number one, be visibly passionate. Has anyone ever worked with a hater? A tester who sees no good in anything at all. That developer's rubbish, this product's awful. This test case is terrible, this company is dreadful. How does that make you feel? Pretty rubbish, it brings you down. They are being visibly passionate, but in a negative way. So show your passion in a positive fashion. So try not to be that hater. Try to be a force for good. Be aggressively open-minded. Has anyone ever worked with a tester that won't listen to new ideas? Lots of nods, this is. Be aggressively open-minded. There's a phrase from a very, very clever chap called Paul Graham. It seems to me that beliefs about the future are so rarely correct that they usually aren't worth the extra rigidity they impose. And that the best strategy is to be simply, is simply to be aggressively open-minded. Instead, of trying to point yourself in the right direction, admit you have no idea what the right direction is, and try instead to be super sensitive to the winds of change. Now, Paul Graham's an investor, 
and a very clever chap, and his blog is fundamentally an amazing place to get lots of technical insights on how people and businesses work. I might slightly disagree with some of this. I think you do need to know the rough direction you're going in. Toyota have this principle of true north. It's where they want to head to, but they know it's not going to be a direct line. They are open to change. They are aggressively open-minded. And if you're an aggressively open-minded tester, I think you will embrace the change that most businesses are going through. Draw a frame around yourself, but don't be restrained by it. Now, what do I mean by this? We like to define ourselves. I'm a tester. You're a developer. You're a scrum master. I'm here. You're there. But when we define ourselves, we confine ourselves. When we define ourselves, we confine ourselves. In a team, <clears throat> you may have a product owner, scrum master, tester, developer, and people like to draw boxes around themselves and say, this is my work, and this is your work, and this is their work. In my experience, to make massive, disruptive change to the company that you're working in, in a positive way, is to ignore the frame, or to extend the frame, and work within the boundaries between roles. And this is where the ideas of self-organized teams come from, where we just have a team. We have a group of people who are specialists. And they have problems in the team. The team have problems, but everybody works together to solve it. And this is great. As a tester, you might be looking at an issue over here and completely and utterly ignoring it, because it's not in your job spec. That's not how change happens. Change happens by pushing the boundaries of your position, of your role, and looking at problems and solving them. Get smart. A great tester or great employee is somebody who gets smart about the business they are joining. Rob talked a little bit about this last night. Find out who your stakeholders are. Find out who's pushing buttons, pulling strings, who's the one that is in power. Who's the one that's helpful? There's a general heuristic that you can generally tend to do when you work in a development team. When developer one gives me some code, probably going to be pretty good. When developer two gives me some code, though, it probably won't even install. Has anyone worked with a developer like that? Well, you know it's going to be easy. You're going to find basic stuff. Get smart. Find out who that developer is. Find out who the helpful ones are. Find out who can help you make the change you need to help. By becoming super smart about the company you work for, you will widen your awareness. And with a wider awareness, you will be surprised a lot less often. If you know a release is coming up, if you know you've just landed a new customer, if you know that changes are afoot in a marketing department or the sales department or whatever, you are going to be able to widen your awareness. You're going to be able to know about the changes, and you can help to either influence them, expect them, deal with them when they do happen, and fundamentally make the big positive change that you need to make. One of the things that we have in our industry is a, um, a kind of very positive thing right now, where we have lots and lots of people saying how testing should be done. And I actually thoroughly enjoyed Rob's talk last night. Did everyone get to see it? It was good. Because that was almost one of the first times I've ever seen somebody say, here is how a lot of people do it, and it's not so good. And here's some really good and interesting and very valuable ways of doing it. You might have to do this stuff, but don't ignore this stuff over here. And the key point from that is that somebody somewhere is enjoying massive success doing probably the complete opposite of what you are. If you're agile, you might be successful. But there's probably a waterfall project somewhere that's achieving massive success. So the key point here is don't just follow what the latest trends are. 
Become smart about the company you work for and adapt the process for the company. Don't just say, I'm going to do Agile, because everyone else is. Find out why you need to do Agile. Is it even relevant? Can you even do it? Be in line with the purpose of the business. If the purpose of the business is to sell lots of software, adapt a process that supports that. Who's the customer? Does anyone here know who they actually work for? Oh, a few. No, I'm not too sure. Yes, there's a hand at the back. I like it. This is good. Who do you work for? Do you work for your management team? Do you work for the investors, the chairman? You work for all of those people. But you also work for the customer. Without the customer, there is no business. How many people know who actually uses their software? Is the user of the software the same person that buys it? Unlikely. The person that buys it might be a CFO that sits behind a spreadsheet somewhere saying, ooh, that looks cheaper, we'll go for that. The people using it might be using it thinking, why are we using this? It doesn't meet our purpose. Because it's cheap. Oh, that's fine. Let's just deal with it. And they complain. And the CFO might say, it's cheap, just deal with it. But you're providing a service. Rob talked about this last night as well. What values do your customers have? He talked about a great example of going around to different companies, knocking on the door, and finding out what values that customer has. It's like getting smart. Get smart about the business, but get smart about your customers. Who actually uses your software? And then focus on them. Focus on meeting their expectations. Focus on going out and meeting them. One of the things we've tried and still trying uh, quite, quite hard with is to get all of our testers out to our customers. So they can sit with them. They can sit with the people who use the software and find out how they use it. And it is eye-opening. I've done this at every company I've ever worked for. You are very surprised often at quite how they use it. You'll spot all sorts of stuff that you could get back to the team and improve. Your next challenge is then convincing everybody to change the software to meet the customer's needs. But you should focus on them as a tester. You should focus on them as an employee. Number six, and the good thing about having a top 10 list is you kind of know when you get into the end, don't you? But we will spend a bit of time on this one. Your job as an employee, your job as a tester, is to constantly, relentlessly improve the process that you work in. That's everybody's job. If you find yourself sat there banging your head against the wall and not having the will to make a change, then you've given up. You can improve everything, even if it's just one tiny thing at a time. But only improve it from your customer's perspective. There's a path of least resistance. We create things that make our lives easier. We don't do this and we don't do that because it's easier just not to do that. But the person that suffers is often the customer. Because we made our worlds easy, but our customers now suffer. And this is the point when I was hoping to get 10 people on this stage. Can I have some volunteers? Does anyone want to come up on stage and just take part in a little exercise? Yes, this is good. Wow, so keen. How many have we got? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Excellent. Tier one. Tier two. Tier two waiting. You can see what's coming. Tier three, dev. In dev. And if you can all stand in the order that I've handed them out, if that's useful. In test, accepted. In test, failed. failed. <laughs> in release. Oh, we may have got too many volunteers here. Yeah. You can do this if you want. Bill, you're live. Oh, hey. <laughs> so, if you could spread out a little bit. 
Can everyone see? I know there's a pillar in the way. You might not be able to see all of this. So, this. Does anyone know what this is? Apart from a group of testers holding pieces of paper. Does anyone have a guess? It's a workflow. It's a workflow. In fact, if we could just move down, because I need to walk along the workflow. Has anyone seen a workflow like this? You probably all worked in one of these. Yeah, it is. It's a workflow. And it's a workflow for a customer case. And this is a real workflow that I've seen somebody optimized to look like this for a customer case. Does anyone want to hazard a guess why they may have written or created a workflow that is so long? Because it can. can, yeah. For reporting. Somebody somewhere has to produce a report of where customer cases are in the system that they work in. I am going to live the life of a customer case. And I would suggest you do the same thing with anything in your business. Staple yourself to it and follow it as it goes through your system. So I'm a customer case. I'm not very happy. You know, the software is not working. So I'm going to go to tier one and go, hi, Chris. Good morning, Rob. It's good. I, I'm not happy. Something's broken. Oh, yeah. And Chris says, well, I'm only tier one. I'm a receptionist, basically, a receptionist service for the customer. And I just raise a defect, and I pass it to tier two. So I go to tier two, and Raymond. And I say, Raymond, I'm really not happy. And Raymond says, uh, not enough information. So he bounces it to tier one. And tier one say, well, there's a report snapshot about to be taken today. And I don't want cases in my queue. So I'm going to pass it back to Raymond and say, well, you investigate your tier two. That's what you do. And so Raymond goes, I'm not having it in my queue. So he passes it to waiting. And this is Rasmus. And Rasmus says, well, he says nothing because he's waiting. <laughs> and I'm going to see how long I can stand here and make you all uncomfortable <laughs> whilst I wait. Well, the report's been taken. It's fine. So tier two brings me back. Look, I'm really not happy. I just, what's happening? Yeah. And you're like, well, I don't know. I'm going to pass you to tier three. And tier three was development. And Dan is in development, but he's not accepted this yet. No. Not enough information. So he passes it back to tier two. And tier two says, I don't know how to get the information. So it goes back to tier three. And Dan in development says, you know what? We'll, we'll just deal with this, yeah? Like, bring it in. So brings it in, and it goes into dev. And now dev are working on it. This is great. But dev are like, well, what's the issue? And it goes back <laughs> to tier two. And tier two says, I don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> My Fitbit, this is good. This is good. <laughs> and I'm in dev now, and dev are starting to work on this. And they're like, all right, we'll get the logs. And they go and get the logs and this. And they ring up the customer. A developer ringing up a customer, you can see how our roles are changing. They get some information. They do a fix. It was an issue. It's fine. It's good. We fix it. It's not a problem. So he passes it to test. Oh, now we have a tester. Nope. <laughs> test failed. And it sits there for a while. And then it goes back to dev. Yes, and we're in dev. And you can imagine now the customer. The customer, the person that we are supposed to be there for, is over here using the software, going, there's a problem. Why is there still a problem? Good job you don't work in a yearly release cycle, because my word, that would be a long wait. But the issue is still here. It's in dev, and we're still working on it. And we pass it, we pass it, and it fails again. We don't have enough information, so we go back to tier two. Oh, you can see the point I'm trying to make. I may be a bit too laborious. But basically, in the end, it's in test, it's accepted. It goes into a release. And again, depending on your release cycle, uh, well, it could be a week, it could be a day, it could be an hour. Some companies are running these release cycles super fast. It could be a month, it could be a year. And I know one company that's still releasing once every two years. Wow. But in live instances, you know, we can put a patch out. So it goes live, and now Bill's got it. And now we have to tell the customer. So we have to go back to all of these stages and go, what did you do? What did you do? Let's all collate it together. What did you do? What did you do? How long was it in here? And all the time, snapshots and reports have been created. And the customer, well, it's the customer who suffers for all of this. And this is a process that a tester put together so that they could report to some manager somewhere who said, I want to know the state of my cases as we go through the process. And so here's what I did. 
I said, well, we're going to go live. We've got to go live so we can keep this. In the release, I got rid of this phase. I'm sorry, mate. Take a seat. Thank, Thank you. you. In test, well, what I did here was failed, accepted. Dev, well, we created a dev team that inc included testers. So we merged all three of these together. So sorry. Sorry. Thank you. You can take a seat, guys. Thank you. We kept dev. Tier three was dev. We got rid of this accepted phase. Sorry, Dan. Take a seat. Hi. Tier two waiting. Why would we wait on this? This is an issue. Got rid of you. Sorry. Thank you for your help. Raymond, we still need tier two, so we'll move you up here. And tier one, let's move you here. So now, does anyone think this process is going to be better? Of course it is. A customer case comes in, and these people here now are able to deal with it. So we've trained Christopher. Christopher can now respond to the customer and say, you know what? I'm going to go and get the logs. I'm going to have a look at the live servers. I'm going to use the monitoring tools that we've put in place. And I'm going to answer the question right here. So most of the calls that come in are just about issues that tier one can now deal with, which is great. Some still need to go to tier two, but now these guys get access to the logs and the servers and everything so they can do the analysis as well, which is great. Very few now come into dev. And if it does come into dev, the whole team swarm on it. Testers, developers, product owners, everybody. And then it goes live. And if your release cycle is good enough, that could be within 20 minutes. This whole process now supports the person who we exist to support, and that is the customer. So do not locally optimize your process unless it adds value for your customer. Thank you to my volunteers. You can all take a seat. Thank you. Cheers, Bill. Thank Thanks, mate. <coughs> so when you find yourself looking at a process and thinking, I could optimize this, think about whether that makes sense for your customer. If it does, do it. If it doesn't, and you have to jump through rings of fire to provide a service for your customers, then continue to jump through the rings of fire and slowly try to improve those as you can. So improving the process is actually incredibly easy, and I'm amazed that more people don't do this. You saw the process here. And this is how you do process improvement. So this is how you bring about change. You observe the process. I showed you the process. I walked at least 10 miles backwards and forwards along through this process. You observed it. You all saw it. And you all knew it was wrong. So then you improve the process. And I'll give you a clue. 99.9% .9 of all problems, as Jerry Weinberg said, are people. Somebody somewhere wanted a report that ended up in that particular process. Fix the process, but not with IT. It would have been easy to take all of those stages and automate them and do various different things and bring in new tools that would allow you to do it. But don't do that. Fix the process first and then bring in IT. And how many people in here, honest show of hands, have ever worked on an IT project where you have no idea what it is you're actually trying to fix? A few, and a few not willing to put their hands up. It's because we bring in IT, and somebody from IT comes along and says, well, we can fix that process by building you this, 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 and this, and it will automate everything, and it will all be wonderful. And we end up working on it. But we haven't solved the problem from our customer's perspective. And this comes from a guy called John Seddon, who I would encourage you to check out on his website, Vanguard. I don't know the full address, but he's got some videos on there, some very, very interesting videos where he takes apart um, Prince 2, standards, and all sorts of craziness that companies bring in to try and improve a process. It's an absolute gold mine for testers. Number seven, we're getting there, nearly to the end. Do what you say you will do. Does anyone work in an agile environment with the definition of done? Yes. A few. Does the definition of done always get followed? No. <laughs> Why do you have it? You have it because you think it's going to make the world better. It's going to make your process better. So do what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody to try and tease out why they're behaving that way, then go and do it. 
Integrity is super, super important. And the best testers and the best employees are the ones that say, I'm going to do this, and they go and do it. They might not be successful, but they're going to go and have a go. Apologies for making drinking noises in the mic. Communicate well. Become uber great and learn how to communicate. So, as a hiring manager, I like to talk to lots of other hiring managers, and the number one common trait and common behavior that almost every hiring manager looks for is a good communication skills. And there's been a few talks here this week. I did a workshop actually earlier on in the week about communication because it's so fundamentally important. But we don't get taught about communication at school. There's not an education system, I don't think, on the planet that teaches people to be good communicators. We don't get taught how to do public speaking. We don't get taught how to negotiate, how to have difficult conversations. And we certainly don't get taught how to do active listening. If you think you're communicating well, the chances are you're probably not. So communicate more and more and more. All communication has a purpose, an audience, and a context. The more purposes you have, the harder it is to get it right. The more audiences you have, the harder it is to get your message right. And the more context in which you operate, the harder it is to get your message right. But simply knowing that and being aware of it is enough to help you improve your communication. And understanding nonverbal communication, I genuinely believe, is a superpower. Being able to read somebody like a book is a very, very powerful skill. If you're trying to change somebody's mind, and you can approach them and have a conversation, and you can read their body language, because body language accounts for about 80% of the meaning that you get from communication. If I say something, the words are what I've said. But if I say something, my body will be giving off 80% of the meaning. I'm sure you've had that. Somebody said something to you, and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I don't trust what they've just said. They're lying. Or they're saying it to make me feel happy. Understanding nonverbal communication is key to influencing, to um, persuading, and it's key to being a good employee. Now, be careful. With all superpowers comes a dark side. And I'm not going to use a quote from a film, although I'm sure Dan. <laughs> With great power, it becomes no, I'm not going to. Spider a Spider Man. It is a superpower. You essentially can change a situation. You can walk into a room and you can immediately change the situation. Now, if you use it for good, it can be a very positive thing. And if you meet particularly influential people, you will find they are superb at communicating. They are superb at dominating a room and changing the way people feel. You've spoken to people who've made you feel amazing after just a few seconds speaking to them. It is a superpower, but it can also be used to manipulate, to hurt people, to make people feel inferior. So please, if you are going to learn about nonverbal communication, please use it wisely. Please. <laughs> Number nine, add skills. Skill plus skill plus skill equals value. The more skills you can add, the more value you can add. Now, I said at the beginning, we recruit for a person, but that person still has to have some skills. We can teach skills. We can't teach the other stuff very easily. Has anyone heard of somebody called Scott Adams? He is the author of a very famous cartoon called Dilbert. And he has an excellent book called How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. It's a brilliant book. If you think extraordinary talent and a maniacal pursuit of excellence are necessary for success, I say that's just one approach and probably the hardest. When it comes to skills, quantity often beats quality. He uses his own words. He says, am I the world's best cartoonist? No. Gilbert's great. It's better than anything I could ever produce, that is for sure. Is he the funniest person on the planet? Probably not. Was he ever successful at business? Nope. 
But all of that mashed together has allowed him to create one of the most successful comics on the planet. And the same is happening with testers. I know a tester who is also a support manager, and he's also incredibly good at technical writing. That makes him a lot more relevant, a lot more employable. He's able to solve more problems and change more things. We have testers who can code and teach. Is Richard here today? Or is he still sleeping in? <laughs> Richard Bradshaw, the friendly tester. He is a tester who can code, and he's been here at this event this week teaching it. It's a very powerful set of skills. We have testers who become managers. I'm one of those. I was a tester. I still am a tester, but I do management. It brings a unique mindset to things. We have testers who are particularly good at marketing, and they're very good at coaching, and they have created their own businesses from this. This is skill plus skill plus skill. If you're wanting to work in a country, an emerging market, like let's say, for example, China, if you can speak Chinese and you can test, wow, what a powerful place to be. That's great. That's valuable. It's relevant. And you don't have to stop at two or three skills. You can add as many as you want. And this fundamentally leads to something that is called a T-shaped person. Has anyone heard of the phrase T-shaped? Good, excellent. It was originated from a company called IDEO, who do design and inspiration and problem solving and all sorts of cool stuff. And I don't have a picture, but if you imagine the shape of a letter T, with the main bit of the T and then a part that goes across the top, they call T-shaped people. They have a core skill. That could be testing. But then across the top, they have a broad range of skills. They're not experts in those things, but they are able to talk to people. They're able to work in different domains. DevOps, developers who learn about ops. Ops engineers who learn about development. Developers in test, developers who learn how to test. Or testers that learn how to code. It's a very powerful thing. The T-shaped concept is excellent. And finally, and I'm running a little bit early, but finally, number 10 is be brave. This is a trait, this is a behavior that we see in very successful change makers. They are brave. They're not afraid to go up to somebody who is possibly hierarchically higher in the chain and say, this is not working. That idea is stupid. You might want to say it slightly differently than that. <coughs> But don't be afraid to challenge the norms and the status quo. Don't just go into a team, into a company, into your work, and sit there and say, well, this is just the way that we do it. Challenge it. Ask questions. Improve it. And don't be afraid to try new ways of working. But be careful. As I said earlier, don't just follow what somebody on stage, like myself, has just said to do. Think about it. Get smart about your company. Be brave to suggest new ways of working. And all of this, these 10 behaviors, are the 10 behaviors that I think exemplify an amazing, great, and talented employee, whether that's a tester, a developer, a scrum master, it makes no difference. Be visibly passionate in a positive way. It will inspire others to join you. You can make great change just by being incredibly passionate and positive about what it is you want to change. Number two, be aggressively open-minded. Do not say, this is my plan, and I am going to follow this plan, and I am going to hit an obstacle, and then I'm going to turn around. Keep going forward. Be aggressively open-minded. Draw a frame around yourself. You can say, I'm a tester. This is what I do. But if there's a problem over there, and it isn't in your frame, and it isn't in a developer's frame, and it sits between the two of you, who's going to pick it up? Pick it up. Deal with it. That's how change happens. Become company smart. Work out who's good, who's bad, what your company does, what's happening. Learn who your customers are. Find out who you truly work for, because without the customer, you have nothing. Relentlessly improve the process, but only from your customer's perspective. And do what you say you will. If you say you're going to do it, do it. Communicate. Become excellent at communicating. Number nine, add skills. Skill plus skill plus skill. Very, very valuable. 
And finally, be brave. Do not be afraid to challenge the status quo. Now, by my clock, I've been talking for an hour and a bit. But it's clearly wrong. <laughs> so, I first would like to say thank you to Greta and Helena and all of the organizing team, because like I said at the start, this genuinely is one of the better conferences on the circuit. It is absolutely fabulous. It is a great mix of people, and I thoroughly enjoy it. And I thank you for inviting me to be a keynote, which was great. Thank you to all of my willing volunteers who helped display a terrible process. And of course, thank you to every single one of you who is in here. You can find me at my blog, thesocialtester.co.uk. I'm doing a new management course next year called Cultivated Management. I'm on Twitter. And this is the company I work for, New Voice Media. So thank you. Thank you. And I see already the first person who wants to ask a question. Yeah, thanks, Rob, for your insightful uh, presentation. Um, now, since I'm a hiring manager myself, I'd be very much interested in how you conduct uh, interviews. So how is your hiring process? Could you elaborate a bit on that? I can, yeah. Um, so the, hi the hiring process depends. If you're, if you're a tester, it's, it's slightly different. Uh, and I'll, I'll approach it from a development point of view, and I'll say the bit that we omit for testers. Okay, so um, the initial part, if you are a developer, for example, is we would send you a coding exercise. Obviously, you've got to get through the CV. We'd obviously make sure that's okay. And then we send you a coding exercise to do at home. It takes about two or three hours. Immediately filters out the people that just want a job. That's fine. We don't want those people. We want people who want a career with us. Um, and then secondly, the coding exercise comes in. It gets reviewed. We do a phone screen just to make sure that everything's good. Um, and we're happy and we like the candidate, because obviously we hire for the people as well as the skills. And then, if all good, we come for an interview. And if you're a developer, you are um, taken into a room with a few of the other developers and you're asked to extend the code that you wrote, just to be sure that A, you wrote it, <laughs> and B, you know what you're talking about. And we throw some curveballs in there, so all sorts of stuff. We might throw in some requirements have changed or, you know, this is not going to work, or you've now got a memory constraint on the servers, just to see how people respond under pressure. And then there's a face-to-face -face interview uh, with at least a minimum of five or six people in different stages, not all in the room at the same time. That can be a bit daunting. Um, and then fundamentally, if any one of those people um, is not happy or, or, or not content with the candidate, then they will not get offered. So it's labor-intensive, um, but it keeps the bar quite high. Um, for testers, you basically admit the coding exercise and the extension, but recently we've started to give testers uh, very practical um, tests with people like Dan and a couple of other guys in the team who will sit with them and ask them, why are you exploring that? Why are you doing this? Why this? Why that? Um, so that's, that's basically it. It's labor intensive. It's incredibly effective, um, but it does mean that we basically cannot just go to the market and say, we want to hire you, 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 and you come into the team. What it does do is it helps us to create a team that's what we want it to be. Does that answer your question? Thanks. So um, you mentioned 10 behaviors. If you had to choose one that was the most important out of the 10, what would you go for? I'm not asking for our overall recommendation for others, but what's the, what's the standout one for you out, out of the 10? I, that's, the, that's a really interesting question because I don't, think you, I don't think you'll ever find anyone that's just got one of those um, because they're all so intertwined. But if I had to choose one, it would be communication. I think effective communicators can pretty much make any change and be uh, an effective employee in any company, in any position. Right. Chris. Thank you for an excellent keynote. Going back to the recruitment process, for testers, I think there's an interesting anecdote you mentioned in the past on uh, exploring how testers are with exploratory testing and a, a brick. Would you mind explaining or expanding a bit on that? Sure. So the, there's an exercise that we used to run during interviews. We don't do it anymore. Um, 
we've changed to something else. But we, we ran it as a test team as well. And one of the things that we, that we found was it, that there's this exercise, and you basically, you've probably heard of it. You take a household brick, you know, a brick that's used to build a house, and you ask people to come up with as many uses for the brick as possible. And there is no right or wrong answer. But generally, and this is not, not across the board, but, but generally I would say very technical people come up with fewer ideas than more creative people. Now, that's a label. I'm not going to say you're creative, you're technical. That's nonsense. I'm not left or right. You are you. But testers who are particularly good at exploratory testing, in my experience, you have to stop them coming up with more ideas. And they are amazing. You know, one of the guys said, well, in England, some of the bricks have holes in them. So I'd put it on a table and I'd use it to balance my sniper rifle in. Where does that come from? And other people, there's the obvious ones. You throw it at someone, you know, you smash a window with it. They're the kind of obvious ones. Uh, we have somebody who would grind it down and use it as a home for some worms. Again, where's that come from? You know? And they're basically coming up with all these sorts of things. And it's, like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. There is no um, that kind of like, you failed, you've succeeded. But it's just to get people to start thinking about um, their world and how they would interact with this thing that they've got. And when we ran it as a test team, we've got a fairly big office um, meeting room. We ran it as a test team, and the post-its went from one side all the way down, all the way across the floor, and then all the way up the other side. We had literally hundreds and hundreds of ideas. And you can start to see that some of the more creative testers that are a lot more elaborate with their thinking and their designs come up with a lot more ideas than some of the other testers who may be a bit more uh, focused on the functional stuff and a lot of the code base and stuff. Um, but like I say, there is no. You are creative, you're not. Everyone's on a spectrum. But it's a great exercise. More questions? Hi. Um, Hi. I had a question about this direct character you mentioned earlier. So how does someone get to be, uh, get to be really good at what they do without actually having the right attitude? So how, how does that happen? It, it's incredibly easy, you know. It, it really is. You know, there's a lot of uh, resources. There's all sorts of stuff you can get to a conference. You know, people come to conferences. They learn lots of good stuff. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they can then take that stuff and effectively implement that into a business. So there is a big difference between knowing a lot of stuff and then knowing how to bring that into a company, and that is where the behaviours come in. So you know, if you know nothing, you're unlikely to be able to make any positive changes because you don't know what to try. But if you know all of this stuff, but you don't have these behaviors, it can result in all sorts of people um, generally just not happy with their jobs, um, people not listening to them. They've probably got some great ideas. They just don't know how to communicate that. And they may become very negative, or you know, they're a negative person. And when they talk about ideas, it's like, this is rubbish how we're working at the moment. We need to do this. And Katrina did a great um, session yesterday talking about how you can couch some of these ideas that you want to change in a way that is a lot more effective. And the spin model was, was really good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's rife, you know. There's lots of people who are incredibly talented that just, you know, you meet them and you just wouldn't want them on your team. And I think when you work that out and you say, would I want to work with this person, and you decompose what it is about people in your team that are really super effective, you generally come to a set of values and a set of behaviors that can help guide your recruitment. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Any more questions? Hello. Toby. Um, traditionally, a CV is very much skill-based. So yep. how would you express these behaviors on a CV? Yep, OK, so CVs, there's lots of all sorts of different ones. Usually there's a chronological one, which is I worked here, and I worked here, and I worked here. They're the best ones for outlining some of the behaviors that you've done. There's the skills-based one where you, know, you have like IT skills, communication skills, and what have you. I would always suggest you do a hybrid. So you do, at the top, your current position. And in that current position, you talk about the outcomes. So going back on the slide, Da, 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 da. I'll get there. Behaviors and outcomes. So behaviors and outcomes are all that matter. So the outcome is what you should put on your CV. So as part of this team, I was able to change our release cycle from yearly to weekly, which resulted in our ability to ship software much more effectively for our customers. And I did this through 
collaboration, working with people, defining the requirements and a huge amount of persuasion or whatever. They're the kind of things that you should put on your CV. That's better than I worked in an environment where I helped make the release process shorter. I mean, that, that pretty much sucks. So CVs are a great way of doing that. And keep it short, keep it succinct. A CV is literally just a, a, a kind of opportunity for people to say, speak to me later. It's that kind of marketing, it's that kind of, it should not describe your world. It should be a teaser to get people to read it and go, I want to speak to this person. Two at a max. Any more than that? Most hiring managers have a general heuristic, which is more than two pages, it goes in the bin. Um, we don't, but um, that's one of those general things. Um, and you know, don't just list skills. Don't just list you know, SQL, C Sharp, Ruby, whatever. Don't just say, I'm skilled in these things, because that means nothing. You know, how skilled are you in them? How have you used those skills to make a difference to the company that you work for? And the CV should be simple, clean, minimalist, not a lot on there. And I would always suggest that you supplant lots of URLs to other stuff so that people can see it. So LinkedIn profiles, if you've got a blog, that's great. Social channels, you're happy to share, obviously. You know, they're maybe not interested in your Facebook stuff. Um, so that people can read that and say, this is an interesting candidate. I'm going to go and find out a bit more. They'll do that search anyway. So you may as well at least point them to the right profile so they don't find someone else with the same name who's got a much more spurious online presence. That's what I would suggest. Is that good, Toby? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Chris. So graphic designers are, in general, encouraged to bring a portfolio with them to work interviews. Developers nowadays are supposed to have GitHub or Bitbucket accounts showing yep. their code. Yep. Would you say this is a good idea for testers as well? And if so, what kind of portfolio could we bring to job interviews? I mean, a lot depends on the kind of company you're applying to. So, but, but if you, I would say yes, definitely. So I wouldn't necessarily bring anything to an interview. But I think the interview, like I say, the CV is an opportunity for you to say, here I am, this is me. I'm interested in you really want me to come and work for you. And I really want to come and work for you. And the hiring manager, if you're a good one anyway, will automatically go online and find that stuff. So the easier you can make it for, for them to find the right things. So for example, if you have your own website, you can include a page, which is just a, an outline of the projects and further details. And you can point them to that. Or you can point them to LinkedIn, which is actually pretty good for uh, recruitment. They'll be recruiting on there anyway. And um, taking stuff in, if you've built something, if you've got your own code base, you know, there's testers with test um, applications in their own code base. Yeah, share it, absolutely. The key thing for me is, though, I wouldn't want them to bring it to an interview. Because the interview is about building a rapport and building a relationship. I will have done my research on that stuff before the interview. But not all interviewers will do. So yeah, carry it along, stick it on an iPad or in your bag, have it there if you want to talk about it, definitely. Any other questions? Still asleep? That wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Not because of you. <clears throat> OK, I have one question about uh, changing processes. Uh, what if you are a, cons a consultant or just working on a short contract? Should you always look out for processes, even though you probably don't even know the entire process or aren't really that familiar with the company at the moment? Uh, that's, um, I, I guess it's a contextual thing. If you're going to be there for like three months and you, you're going to go in and go out and just do your work, then possibly not. But there'll be processes around your work that you can try and improve. And I'd suggest uh, talking to the people who probably know the system. The system is in the, the place that you work is just one big system. Um, there'll be people that know a lot more about that. And it could be that you find those people. Again, get smart, find out who those people are and say, look, I've got this idea. I don't know whether it's going to work. Um, you know a lot more than I do. This is my suggestion. Um, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be almost unprofessional to go into a business and see things that you know could be improved and do nothing about that. But that's my own personal approach. And uh, yeah, so I'd say yes. Any more? What can I? Take this off because it, it hurts. <laughs> pain, pain is good. Pain is good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if it doesn't hurt, you're doing something wrong. So, I have a question. Go for it. I can ask anything, right? Yeah. Okay. What did I do last night? 
I don't know. Did you have a memory leak by any chance? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> I tried to get an early night, but uh, uh, there was no joy with that. So, uh, a big round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Don't move out of light. Thanks for a very nice speech. And uh, here's a little box. Wow, thank you. I uh, hope it will fit into your suitcase. Uh, uh, possibly. And I'm sure uh, it will fit. Yeah, in the box, you've got uh, a little replica of an Estonian ID card. So you can actually go and uh, apply for one. Excellent. Thank so you. Thank you. Appreciate welcome that. to Estonia again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.